I remember my first date with a beautiful woman I loved. The time I am courting her. And that time, our first date, I can't really understand how I felt. Because it was mixed emotions. Like, I am happy, yet uncomfortable, so excited, yet so nervous. You know, I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do. Am I having a constipation? You know, a bit of shyness, but I have to overcome. I mean, literally, I don't have any other choice but to pursue her. I said, go, 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 it's a green light, and I am afraid that someone might overtake me. With all those mixed emotions, one feeling I am certain, and one decision I should take, that one feeling is my love for her, and that one decision is to present my best version of myself in order to win her heart and hearing the approval of the word, yes. In our Christian life, we are expected to do our best for God, to do our best to God. We are to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed. This is why this day, let's study the word of God about being the best version of yourself. Our passage found in the book of 2 Timothy in chapter two, verses 14 to 19, again, our passage found in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, verses 14 to 19. The very word of God says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them, are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this ins inscription. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. The very word of God instructed us to do our best to God, to do our best for God, to show the very best version of ourselves. And for that in verse 14, it is do your best to protect the word of God. In verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God. In verse, verses 16 to 18, it is do your best to persevere in faith for God. And in the last verse, verse 19, it is do your best to proclaim the glory of God. In these particular verses of the passage, this is where Paul instructed the young pastor Timothy to be on guard 
and keep on reminding the people of God because there were teachings there that rapidly spreading like a bacterial infection. One of the teachings that was the belief that there was no resurrection anymore. The sad part to this fact is that belief spread caused by one of the considered leaders of the Christian community who got influence and destroy the faith of some Christians there. The church is facing the problem within the church. That is why in verse 14, it starts with an active progressive word, a continuous instruction to keep reminding God's people. That is to warn them before God, or in other translation, charge them before God. It means you are accountable to everything that you said to the people, especially when you are using the word of God, that you are responsible for what is happening. If the doctor gives wrong medication to the patient and it causes severe infections, then the doctor is directly responsible for what had happened. In the same way, the words you utter out from your mouth, you are responsible for all of those words. In verse 14, we found out the root, the reason, and the result. That is why the root of the conflict, the cause of the conflict, that cause quarreling among all believers is the misinterpretation of the word of God. And the other one is the unbiblical teaching and the other cause is any misleading information that cause people go astray, astray and choose the wrong path opposite to what the Bible says. We need to remember that we are not just called to protect ourselves, we are called to protect the Word of God. The human tendency is that when we are in problems, when we are in trials, when we are in pain, when we are in hurt, the tendency, we forget to protect the Word of God and we prioritize to protect ourselves. Why we need to protect the word of God? We need to protect the word of God because it is the manual of our life. It gives instructions, directions that we need to follow in order to live in this world. We believe in God, we believe in Jesus Christ, believe in the resurrection, believe in the forgiveness of sins, Believe that Jesus Christ died for the humanity. Believe that Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and believe that Jesus Christ will come again. We need to remember, listen, that if you want to protect yourself, protect the word of God. When you protect yourself, the word of God will protect you will protect you away from any misinterpretation of the word of God with any, from any misleading informations, from any unbiblical teachings. And the word of God will protect you. So this one, we need to do our best to protect the word of God, to guard the word of God, to seal the word of God, to equip the word of God within your heart and to live the Word of God as our lifestyle. In verse 15, it says, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles 
the word of truth. This is where we do our best to present ourselves, ourselves to God. We are called to present ourselves approved by God, not approved by man, or considered to be a self-gratifying person. In verse 15, here we can see the boldness of the gospel and the boldness of faith. That in the gospel, a worker does not need to be ashamed. You know, Jesus is not ashamed even in his power, majesty, holiness, perfection, and being God. And ashamed took up the cross, died on the cross for the salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the humanity. And here, our little response is to do our best and ashamed of the gospel. In the boldness of the gospel, that even Jesus Christ in Philippians in chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, it says, Who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. With all those, I'm asking a question. Do we still have a reason to be ashamed of the gospel? For what Jesus did, do we still have a reason to be, an, to be ashamed of the gospel? We should not be ashamed of the gospel. Because in Romans 1, 16 to 17, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The second, in the boldness of faith, a worker who correctly handles the word of truth. We need to remember that the world and Christianity is in chaos, not just because of the lies and unbiblical teaching, but because many Christians are not brave enough to tell the truth. Not telling the truth is the same way accepting the lies that these false teachers are preaching. The Word of God says in chapter 10, verse 17 in the book of Romans, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the Word about Christ that the righteous will live by faith, and how would they know those unsaved remaining or humanity? How would they know about the gospel if we are ashamed of the gospel? When Neil Armstrong, the first man, landed in the moon, the world celebrated, and this is even teach in schools. But when, God, but when God of the universe landed and visited the, the very world he created, the world did not celebrate nor forget that miraculous event from history. Isn't it ironic that the world, isn't it ironic that the God 
who made the world, the God who made humanity, and these people and humans neglect and forget the creator of everything. So I encourage everyone to declare your faith. Declare your faith. Wherever you will go and whatever you do, do your best as a dedicated soldier, a disciplined athlete, and a diligent farmer. We are saved by the grace of God. We are saved by the grace of God so that we will not remain silent of the gospel of Christ. We are saved by the grace of Christ so that we will not remain silent of the gospel of Christ. But, be, but for because of this grace that we have been saved, then it is the grace of God that we are eager to share the gospel of Christ. That in verses 16 to 18, here we do our best to persevere in faith for God. In verse 16, avoid godless chatter or irreverent bubble because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. So be careful what you read and hear because the more you read and hear about unbiblical teachings, the more ungodly your words, your actions, and lifestyle are. Verse 17, their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who, are, I mean, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and, the dis and they destroy the faith of some. You know, it's hard to remember the word Hymenaeus, but in Visayan word, it is um, so easy. Hymenaeus is Hyman, Hymenaeus, Hyman, or Hainman, Asaka, where are you? And that is why Hymenaeus in verse 18 replied, I have departed from the truth. And the teaching of these two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus, is like a gangrene. Gangrene refers to the death of body tissue due to either lack of blood flow or due to serious bacterial infection. Infected area of the body is considered half dead and smells, in the worst case scenario, smells like a rotten flesh buried for how many days? And imagine this is like an biblical teaching spread by Hymenaeus and Philetus. Again, these two men were heretics in the church of Ephesus, denounced by Paul. They were doing most serious injury to the church by their teaching and by what teaching resulted in both moral and physical, including spiritual. The specific error of this man was in verse 18, it says, they say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the fate of some. You know, the resurrection, they said, is not possible anymore. We need to remember that resurrection is one of our hope we cling to. Resurrection connects to the ascension of Jesus Christ and to the coming of Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection, then we are saying that Jesus Christ will not come again. 
we are saying that there is no hope and we are saying that our worship and praises is useless, meaningless, futile. Time will come that there would be no day when the dead would hear the voice of Christ and come out of the grave. The Christian, knowing that Christ was raised from the dead, look forward to the day when his body should be raised in the likeness of Christ's resurrection. But this faith was utterly denied by the teaching of Hymenaeus and Philetus. This teaching of theirs, you know, Paul tells us, had overthrown the faith of some. It would also overthrow the faith of Christian believers. For if the dead are not raised, neither Christ is risen. And if Christ was not raised from the dead, we are still in our sins. We remain unforgiven. The denial of the resurrection of the body, whether of mankind generally or of Christ, is the overthrow of the faith. It leaves nothing to cling to. No living Christ who saves, who leads, who converts his people. The apostle proceeds to say that teaching of this kind is like a gangrene. As a gangrene eats away the flesh, so this teaching eats away Christian faith. Paul is very careful to say more than once that the teaching which denies resurrection of the dead leads to inevitably and godliness. We need to remember that we do our best to persevere in faith for God is because the fight was already won by our Lord Jesus Christ and this is our little response to present ourselves to present ourselves, to persevere ourselves, to persevere if we truly have the qualities of being the victors of Christ and victors for Christ. We are called to persevere in faith, to fight for the battle in faith, and remember, we already are victors for Christ had already won the victory. Again, do your best to protect the word of God. Do your best to present yourself to God. Do your best to persevere in faith for God. And lastly, in verse 19, it is do your best to proclaim the glory of God. In verse 19, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Here in this verse, we found that to proclaim the glory of God, we see the greatness of God and the goodness of God. That in the greatness of God, God knows those who are his. And in the goodness of God, God is willing and just to forgive all the sins if one is sincere to come to God. In God's greatness, we found out the assurance and belongingness. In God's goodness, we found out repentance and forgiveness and forgiveness. In God's greatness, 
the most similar passage is found in John chapter 10 where it talks about the shepherd and the sheep. That in verse 9 in chapter 10 of the book, in the book of John, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. It means that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. In, connecting, in connection to what Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father, no one goes to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And in further verses, in verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That Jesus Christ died for our sins. That Jesus Christ died for his great, great and conditional love for humanity. That he is the good shepherd. And in verse 14, that the good shepherd, Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep knows me. It means that God knows his people and expected that the people of God knows or know who God is. And one of the examples, if we truly know God, is we are very respectful to God. We give reverence to God. How about in our prayer? Did we treat God of who he is? That he is the God of the universe? Or we treat God of what we want? We treat God out of our selfishness? Or we treat God out of our gratefulness? That is why in verses 27 and 28 in chapter 10 in the book of John, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. That the people of God listen to the word of God, listen to the voice of God, and know what is and what is not about the word of God or misinterpretation of the word of God. And here he said, I know them, and they follow me. And anybody who follows Christ, he gives this assurance. He said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Jesus said that. This is a great, great assurance to say that we belong to God, it, it talks about the belongingness, that we belong to God, that we are God's children, that we are in ownership with God, that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that, hey, my child, you belong to me, Jesus said. That God knows you, and he will call you by your name, and he will say, you are my child. And in God's goodness, says here, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Again, let's deal with repentance and forgiveness. Everyone, it means anyone can come to God, regardless of your status, of your race, of your sins, whatever it is, and whoever you might be, how dark your hearts are, how bad is your past, how wicked you might be thinking of yourself, just come to God, and by His miraculous grace, 
if you come with sincere heart, God is just and is more than willing to forgive you and clean you from your sins. You know, the very lies that Satan wants to implant to every minds and hearts of the believers is this. He will let you feel you are worthless, let you feel unforgiven, let you feel unacceptable, unlovable, unworthy, a life without a purpose, a life without a meaning, a life without a value. That you would say, even some Christians would say, that because I am a sinner, but because of this thing, but because of this sin, I am unworthy to come to God because of that. But I would say, this is the lies, this is the problem, and this is the weaknesses that every Christian have been facing. If this is the problem, this is the lie, when we think we feel worthless, when we think we feel unforgiven, unacceptable, unlovable, unworthy, feel like we don't have a purpose in this life, a life without a meaning, and a life that has no value. This is the moment that we needed God the most, not we keep distance from God. This is the time we needed God the most and the time that we need to come closer, 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 intimate relationship with God. You know, in a world we live that is full of expectations, the world has standards and God's standard is higher than the world. I would say we are God's children, you are God's children, you are God's people, I am, belong to God, you have Christ, we have Christ, and for this reason, we are expected to do our best for God, to do our best in everything that we do, that if you are a teacher, you are the best teacher, if you are the businessman, you are the best businessman. If you are a doctor, you are the best doctor. If you are a nurse, you are the best nurse. If you are a student, you are the best student. If you are a janitor, you are the best janitor. You are the best in your profession, best in your family, best in your friends, best among all the workers, best among all, and best of all, and you are doing your best in the ministry of God. Why as though that we do our best to God? It's because we represent Christ in our lives. It's because we have Christ in our lives. If we have Christ in our lives, we are expected changes, new life, transformation, obedience to God, a heart full of passion, for God, to proclaim the glory of God in the greatness of God and in the goodness of God. And this is where we represent, in doing our best, we represent the best version of ourselves. Here, do your best to protect the word of God do your best to present yourself to God. Do your best to persevere in faith to God, for God. And lastly, do your best to proclaim the glory of God. And this is the very best version of yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Thank you for your message that we've heard. Thank you for showing us that we need to do our best because we are expected to do our best to please the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Lord, thank you and help us that 
we will not be mediocre in our in everything that we do, especially in the ministry, especially in reading your word, especially in obedience to the to the commandments that you give to us, Father, and praying that you would seal your word in our hearts, that we are able to apply it and practice it in our daily lives. Lord, I'm praying to all the Christians in the world. I'm praying to all the Christians who are listening right now. I'm praying that you will provide them the strength that they need, that we will do our best. We will do our best to protect your word. We will do our best to present ourselves to you, that we will do our best to persevere even in these trials, that we will do our best to proclaim your glory, to spread your word, to say to the whole world that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power that brings salvation. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. We give you the glory and honor and everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.